Hi, and welcome to Camp Explore. Thank you all for being with us this afternoon. My name is Alex Giannini, and I'm one of the program managers here at the Westport Library. Today, we are so, so honored to welcome Emily Calandrelli. But before we start the show, just a couple of really quick notes. First, a little bit about Camp Explore. I'd like to start today by thanking Roz and Bud Siegel, whose continuing generosity have made these super cool events possible. So thank you, Roz and Bud. Um, each week this summer, the library will host a special guest who's an expert in their field to share their life experience with all of you guys. Our awesome librarians have also created a Keep Exploring resource guide so you can learn more about these incredible people and the things they talk about. So you just click that green button right there by my hand uh, and that'll take you to a special page all about Emily. Second, and now this one's important, so pay attention. If you have a question for Emily, use the ask a question feature right here and we will get to your questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, and now let's get on to our main event. Emily Calandrelli is an MIT engineer turned Emmy nominated science television host. She's featured as a correspondent on Bill Nye Saves the World and an executive producer and host of Fox's Exploration Outer Space, which airs in 100 million households every week. Her first science children's book series, The Ada Lace Adventures is now available for purchase and you should definitely check those out if you haven't. And she recently launched the third Ada Lace book, Into Space, as part of the Storytime from Space program. How cool is that? So everybody, please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming Emily Calandrelli. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. I am so excited to be with you guys today. So as Alex mentioned, my name is Emily Calandrelli. But on the internet, I am known as the Space Gal. And that is because I love everything having to do with space. So I studied a lot of science and engineering when I was younger. I studied mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering. And then I went to grad school and I studied more aerospace engineering. And today I'm a science communicator who talks about science and space on TV, on YouTube, in books, and on uh, things like Netflix. And more recently on TikTok, I'm on TikTok doing lots of science experiments and talking about science and space, which I find to be so, 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 so fun. And so if you're on there, follow me at the Space Gal because I love, love talking to you all there. Um, but yeah, today I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the adventures I've had as a TV show host, as a science communicator. We're gonna do a little bit of the science experiments that I've done on my TikTok. And then I'm gonna open it up to some questions from you guys. I wanna hear from you all and we'll talk more about that. So let me share my screen. I have a little bit of a presentation to show you all. We're just gonna get that up there right now. Perfect. Okay, so as you can see, this is the name of my TV show, Exploration Outer Space. And on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, I'm at the Space Gal. YouTube is actually youtube.com slash Space Gal. Um, and these are just some pictures of the adventures that I've had. As the host of Exploration Outer Space, I get to travel all around the country and sometimes to other countries. And I talk about everything from rockets and spaceships and rovers on Mars and searching for aliens and everything in between. It is quite literally a dream job for me because I'm a big space nerd and I love learning about science. And I get to talk to some of the most like intelligent people in this field and ask them any question I want. And it's just, it's so, so, so fun. I get to learn about questions like, where did we come from and are we alone in the universe? Big stuff, really cool stuff. I'm also a correspondent on a show called Bill Nye Saves the World. Raise your hand in the comments if you've heard of Bill Nye. Bill Nye was somebody who I grew up with. He had a show on when I was a kid and our teachers would bring um, videos of his show into our classrooms to help teach us science and we would chant the bill, 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 bill. And so it's another dream true, uh, dream come true to be able to work with Bill Nye. And that's really, really fun. He also, he loves fist bumps. He loves doing fist bumps. And I am also an author of the children's chapter book series, The Ada Lace Adventures. Ada is a third grader who loves science and technology and goes on adventures to solve mysteries with technology and gadgets that she builds herself. 
Um, and let me know in the comments if any of you have read any of these books. I love um, hearing from the people who have read them. And then maybe let me know like who your favorite character is. I really like Nina. Nina and Ada are my two favorites. But the coolest part about this, Alex mentioned this, but I sent this book, Ada Lace, Take Me to Your Leader, into space last year. And this was so, so cool. So this is through the Storytime from Space program, where they send children's books to the International Space Station. And an astronaut does a read aloud with these books. So this is astronaut Anne McLean on the International Space Station grabbing my book. And she did a read aloud of the entire book on camera. So if you ever wanted to do a read aloud, um, then you could go to storytimefromspace.com and you can find my book being read aloud by an astronaut floating weightless in space. So cool. Now, I think it's very important to tell you that I did not think that this was going to be the career that I was going to have. These are not the adventures that I would have predicted that I would have had when I was your age. And that's because when I was your age, I didn't consider myself one of the smart kids. I grew up in a college town, meaning there was a university in the same town that I grew up in. And so the smart kids, quote unquote, smart kids at my school were the kids who had parents who were teachers or professors at the local university. These parents had PhDs and they were engineers and scientists and that just wasn't my family. I'm the first person in my family or extended family or anyone that I ever knew to pursue a career in science and technology. And so I just kind of thought that this type of, these types of adventures were reserved for the smart kids. But what I learned is that while it did take me a little bit longer to learn some of these things, I could still become as smart as the smart kids. You can make yourself smarter as long as you're willing to put in the work. And so as long as I spent um, as much time as I needed to be able to learn hard concepts, then I could make myself smarter. I could make myself one of the smart kids, which is a really fun thing to know. So how, how did I become the space gal? How did I choose to go into space? Well, it all started with a poster that looked a little bit like this. Because when I was going to college, I knew that I, I liked math and I wanted to get a job that paid good money. And so when I was in high school, I looked up all of the majors that one can major in and I looked at their starting salaries. And I learned that engineers made some of the best money out of all the careers that I could choose from. And so I was like, okay, engineers use math. I like math, they make good money. This is gonna be super hard but I'm gonna do it anyways, we're, we're gonna figure it out. And when I got to college, I didn't know what type of engineering I wanted to do. There's computer engineering and chemical engineering and civil engineering and mechanical engineering and all of these different types. And so I'm walking down the hallways at my university and I see a poster that looks like this. And on that poster, it says something like, do your homework weightless. And I was like, what? does that mean? What kind of nerdy metaphor are they putting out? What is this? And it turns out that it was a class that you could take if you studied aerospace engineering. And as part of that class, you and your friends designed a science experiment to fly on something called the Vomit Comet. Now, raise your hand in the comments if you've ever heard of the Vomit Comet. Because if you haven't yet, I'm going to tell you, it's the coolest thing that you will ever, ever, ever learn about. It is the reason why I decided to go into aerospace engineering. It's the reason that kickstarted my love of space. The Vomit Comet is a plane that flies like a roller coaster in the sky. It is literally like an 8,000 foot roller coaster in the sky. And it flies like that so that the people inside can float weightless like astronauts. And so when it's going over the hump like this, then you feel weightless. And then of course it dives down and it has to go back up like this, like a roller coaster. And that's when you feel really, really, really heavy. So you feel weightless and heavy and weightless and heavy and weightless and heavy and weightless and heavy and weightless and heavy for an hour and a half, which is why they call it 
the vomit comet. Because if you had to ride a roller coaster that intense for that long, you might get sick. Um, and so when you go on the, uh, the vomit comet, you wear a flight suit like we're wearing in this picture. This is me and um, an astronaut, Katie Coleman, who was on one of my flights. And in that, uh, in that flight suit, you have a pocket. It's right under my name tag. And in that pocket, you bring the most important thing that you will bring on that plane. And I want you to guess in the comments what you think that tool is. What do you think the most important thing that you'll bring on that plane is? It has to do with something that uh, would get very messy if you did it when you were weightless. And it is, of course, a barf bag. Because if you get sick when you're weightless, where does that throw up go? It goes everywhere. And this plane, it's not just for fun, it's for experiments. It's this research laboratory that's orbiting, that's floating in the sky. It's this beautiful research laboratory. And so there are experiments all over the walls, the ceiling, the floor, everywhere. And if you had vomit going everywhere, you might get in the research experiments and you don't want that to happen. So when you get sick, and on my first flight, I did get sick. When you get sick, you want to get out that barf bag really quickly, barf in the barf bag and tie it off and then hand it off to somebody who works there, which is probably the worst job that one can have on that plane. But this is the reason why I wanted to go into aerospace engineering. It was the coolest experience of my life. Um, in a little bit, I'll, I'll show you a, a video of that experience. But when I became a TV show host, I was like, I want to share this experience with others. I want to give this experience to another student so that they may love space as much as I do. So when I started my TV show, I told my boss, let's give, let's start this contest called the Student Astronaut Contest, which will be like a nerdy version of American Idol, where you ask all of the students in the country to apply to this contest to win a really, really cool prize. And the one who wins will feature on the show and it'll be a really cool show. And my boss said, you know, no, we've never done that before. I, I just, I don't think it would work. It's not the type of show that you see on educational TV. It's just not something they've ever done before. And I thought, okay, well, I've, I've never done TV before. I'm an engineer, so maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, we get through season one, we get picked up for season two. And season two, I go back to my boss and I say, I really think the student astronaut contest would be a really good idea a nerdy version of American Idol. It's a social media contest where we give away one prize to help launch their career in the space industry. I think it would be really, really cool. And my boss says, okay, you can try it. And we tried it and it worked and it won us our first Emmy nomination. So this is, for me, this was an experience that showed me that throughout your life, you might be the youngest, you might be the least experienced. You may think that sometimes you don't really know what you're talking about, but your ideas can still be worthwhile. Your ideas are still valid and can be very, very exciting. And they, because they're new, because they're different, that might make them even better. So have confidence in yourself when you join these groups where you think that maybe you're the youngest and you don't know enough. Have confidence in your voice to speak up because your idea might be the one that um, really makes a difference. And so we did our student astronaut contest year after year. We gave away a free flight on the Vomit Comet. We trained like a suborbital astronaut at Embry-Riddle. We gave away a, a, a training in Russia, the one in the middle of me and that guy, his name is Lee. We're in Russia. We flew all the way to Russia to train like a cosmonaut at the Yuri Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center. It was something so, so cool. We um, brought someone to Hawaii to live in one of something called the High Seas Habitat. You can see us doing um, a, an EVA mission there in our spacesuits. And it's been one of my, my favorite shows that we've ever done. And so I'm going to show you a video of me and the guy who won the student astronaut contest where we gave away the flight on the vomit comet. So to, to win the contest, we asked students all over the country to submit an experiment idea. What experiment would you want to do on the vomit comet? And this guy, Sam, is a professional dancer. 
and he wanted to test how dance moves would look differently when you're weightless. So this is us doing like a wave, a wavy arm thing that turns out is very difficult to do when you aren't really sure what is up and what is down. This is when I told you how you go through periods of uh, weightless and being heavy. That's when you feel heavy. This is Sam testing a pirouette. That's what it looks like when you do a pirouette on the ground under gravity. And this is what it looks like when you do it on the vomit comet when you're floating weightless. He's way more uh, elegant than I am. This is me not really knowing what I'm doing and banging my head on the wall. <laughs> I am no professional dancer, uh, especially not in weightless conditions. I'm not sure what we're doing here, but I know that it's not working. <laughs> not a very good dance move. I think the hypothesis was that dancing would maybe be more fun in weightlessness, but it turns out that it's actually way harder when you're weightless. This is us discussing that, talking about like, who knew it would be so hard to dance in microgravity? And I'm like, I ha I would have no idea. I had no idea how hard it would be. I'm a bad dancer when it comes to having gravity. And then here's us having fun, just jumping through a hula hoop. Uh, turns out that's actually very difficult to do too, uh, except I'm actually very good at it. Uh, don't wanna brag, but check it out. Not too shabby. I don't even think I touched the sides. Pretty cool. And then Sam uh, tries it again and gets a little bit uh, cocky and shows off his Superman shirt. This is us eating and weightlessness, which is also very hard. I think you made a mess doing that. Um, and that's what the end looks like when you feel very heavy again and then you come back down to the ground. So yeah, that was probably my favorite um, experience I've had with Exploration Outer Space, my TV show on Fox. That one was really fun. Now, another story I wanted to share with you from my TV show is one where I was really scared. And so last year, there was a story that we wanted to cover for my TV show that was about something called the Aquarius Habitat. Now, the Aquarius Habitat is something that researchers and astronauts go and live in for a couple of weeks to do different science and also to practice living in isolation in an extreme environment. What it is, is this like kind of submarine house that is in the middle of the ocean, 60 feet below the surface. And so in order to see it, in order for my viewers on my show to be able to see it, I had to scuba dive down in the depths of the ocean to bring a camera crew down there and be able to show my viewers what it looked like. But here's the thing. One of my biggest fears is scuba diving. I'm actually scuba certified. I got scuba certified in West Virginia and I took all of the classes that you need to take to get the right certification to get all of the, um, like basically the license to be able to scuba dive. But when I got my license, I was scuba diving in this murky lake in West Virginia. You would, I would hold my hand out in front of me and I couldn't even see my fingertips. And it was so, so scary. And after I got it, I said, I'm never, ever, ever, ever scuba diving ever again. I just, I did not want to do it ever again. And so this comes up and they say, well, in order to show it on your show, you have to scuba dive down with us. And I thought, I'm going to have to get over my fear. I'm gonna to have to learn how to get over my fear. So we get on a boat, we go to the middle of the ocean, I get all of my scuba gear on and I get in the water and I look down and I'm thinking, we're in the middle of the ocean, it's gonna be bright blue and beautiful. No, it was murky and dark and I couldn't see very far in front of my face and I started panicking. And my, my breathing sounded like this. I was like, <gasps> <gasps> I was like having a panic attack. I was so, so, so scared. And I thought, okay, I don't know what's going on. I was getting embarrassed, right? I was kind of embarrassed because there was a bunch of other people around. And I was like, oh no, everybody sees how scared I am. This is so embarrassing. Um, but what I realized is that being brave doesn't mean that you're not afraid. Being brave doesn't mean that you don't have fears. It means that you don't let those fears stop you from accomplishing your goals. So I thought, what can I, what can I control? What's right in front of me? I can control my breathing. I can 
breathe in and breathe out really slowly. I controlled my breathing. And I also thought, okay, what else can I control? I can put one hand in front of the other and swim one stroke at a time. I can do that one at a time and just focus on what's in front of me. And so I went down there one stroke at a time, brought my camera crew with me. And I'm telling you, it was the coolest thing I've one of one of the coolest things I've ever done. But I was terrified the entire time. I realized that it's not that I had to get over my fear because I couldn't. I just couldn't get the fear out of my head. But if you can't beat the fear, just do it scared. And so I was terrified the entire time when I was putting one hand in front of the other, one flipper in front of the other, but I was able to do it. And when I got back up to the surface and I got back on the boat, I've never been more proud of myself for anything I've ever done in my whole life. And I think that also shows me that like the things that you are going to be proud about in your life, the things that you're going to be most excited about for yourself are things that you might be scared to do initially. You might think, oh, I don't know if I can join that team. I don't know if I can try out for that team. I'm not very good. Or I don't know if I should, whatever it is, just try. Because those types of experiences will make you feel more confident and more brave and just cooler on the other side. And so if you can't beat the fear, just do it scared. And speaking of being scared, so coronavirus has been very hard on a lot of people, right? And one of the things that happened with coronavirus is that a lot of my jobs got canceled or postponed. All of my filming, I have to travel for filming my show. And I wasn't able to travel. I wasn't able to film. I wasn't able to do anything. And so all of a sudden, for three or four months, everything stopped. And I got really scared. I was like, what's going to happen to my job? What am I going to do? And I thought back to my scuba diving experience. I was like, what can I control? What's right in front of me that I can do right now? And one of the things that I decided to do was to focus all of my energy, all of my science and creative energy on TikTok. And so every single day I would make two or three videos. I'd spend six hours thinking of science experiments and stories to tell you. And over two and a half months, I grew to nearly a quarter million followers on TikTok. And all of the videos that I do, I answer questions like, why is a sunset on Mars blue, right? Or where do they keep all the moon rocks that they brought back from the moon? And I also, uh, I do science experiments. I love doing lots of different science experiments. And one of the other things that I do that I think is really fun, and if you're on TikTok, you know that there's a lot of things on TikTok that are fake, right? There's a lot of tricks that people are putting on there to try to trick you. Um, and so I like to debunk things. I like to do sort of myth busting on TikTok. And I'm going to do a few of those with you today. So here is an example of me myth busting something on the right is a video of someone posting a viral video where they say put Vaseline around an egg and put some toothpaste and soap and vinegar in it and then put some water in it and then go ahead and put that in the uh, fridge for 24 hours. And then at the end, when you're done, when you cut it open, you get this really cool squishy egg. But what's actually happening, because I decided to investigate this myself, was they just went online and bought something called a funky egg, which I have right here, if you can see this. This is just a fake egg. But what's very clever is that there's a hint of truth in this, because if you put an egg in vinegar for 24 hours, you'll be able to remove the shell, and it'll be a, a rubber egg. Uh, it's like the rubber egg exper experiment. And it'll be a little bit squishy, but it won't be this squishy. It'll be um, kind of fragile and it won't be see-through. You won't be able to see the yolk inside. And so this is just a trick and it's uh, just a funky egg, a rubber funky egg. Now I want you to watch this one and try to guess what's going on here. Uh, this, uh, he has some two metal balls and then he's using 
some compressed air, pouring it upside down to make the balls cold. You can kind of hear them sizzle in the video. It's making the metal balls cold. I think he has them in lines or something. Um, this is just a silly thing to trick you. And then he gets a, um, a container of corn, of corn, and he puts the metal balls in the container of corn. And then he puts the lid on and he starts to shake them. And he says something like the corn pops around the metal balls and it turns them a totally different color. So watch what happens when he takes the jar and he starts to shake it. Kind of keep a close eye on those balls and look, it turns yellow. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and do that experiment with you today. I'm gonna show you what I have. So we have a jar filled with corn, right? Jar filled with corn. And we have a metal ball here. And I have some compressed air, but you don't need compressed air. That's just a trick. You don't need compressed air. So I'll recreate what he did. I put the metal ball in the container and we just shake it, shake it, shake it. <gasps> and then it turns orange. Guess what's going on here? Guess what's going on here? This is actually an experiment about density. So a ping pong ball is very light. It's less dense than corn. A metal ball is more dense than corn. So when you put them both in here and you shake them, the ping pong ball is going to rise to the top and the metal ball is going to uh, sink to the bottom. It's the buoyancy force that's pushing it up to the top. So the way that you set it up is you first hide a ping pong ball in your jar of corn, of popcorn, um, and you can't see it, but it's right at the top, right? And then you have your little metal ball, you put it at the top, and then brrrr, voila, it changes to orange. But it's, it's just a trick. It's all about, it's an experiment with density. Experiment with density. So let's go back to the presentation, and we'll show you another one here. here okay so we saw that one all right now watch this video and tell me what you think is going on here so you can see the guy he put um some monster energy drink in a little container like that and then he has some water bottled water that he's putting in a cup um, of course he used the compressed air again that does absolutely nothing and then he puts it in the cup and something weird happens. Watch what's happening. It looks like jellier than before. He's trying to trick you into thinking that the compressed air did something to the monster energy drink. But here's the wild part. Wait for this. He gets ready for this and he grabs into the container and pulls out what looks like he's calling them energy snakes, energy drink snakes. Okay, so let's go back to my experiment. Let me show you what we can do here. Okay, so I have this. Now, this isn't monster energy drink. This is water mixed with highlighter. Uh, this is taped over because I cut open the highlighter. If you cut open a highlighter, what you'll find is this little guy this little guy here, and you can squeeze it and it'll turn water this color. So that's the first thing you do. The second thing you do is you add something called sodium alginate, a big word, but all it is is a food thickener. So this is something that bakers will use in pie fillings or jellies just to thicken up some food. And you can put it in water, and if you look closely, it's just slightly thicker than water, right? It looks slightly thicker. Here's the other thing he did. So you get water. So this is just regular water. He just used bottled water to trick you, but you put um, something else called calcium chloride in water. And this is just like a type of salt. They, can, they put this in ro on roads in the winter. 
And you can't tell, it just looks like regular water. But watch what happens when we pour it in a glass, just like so. And then we take our concoction of highlighter and sodium alginate, and we just put it in like this. Look what's happening. Look what's happening. All right, three, two, one. And we create these little energy snakes like he did. And so when you put the sodium alginate in this calcium chloride water, the outside of it gels up. So it creates this cool little um, snake looking thing. And this is used in baking as well. If you've ever heard of boba, like boba teas, these are, this is similar to how um, the boba and boba teas is made. It's a process called spherification. And so only the outside is gelled. And so if you push this, it'll pop and you can take all the, um, the gooey yellow stuff out of it. So yeah, that's what he did there. But he's just trying to trick you into thinking that that had something to do with monster energy drink, which it didn't. But it's really fun for me to go on TikTok and see what's going viral and then figure out what's actually going on here. Because a lot of times it's a fun science experiment that they're just not explaining. They're just trying to trick you into thinking that it's something else. So that was a very, that's a fun one. Um, and then, oh, whoops, I want to do a science experiment with you. Okay. So another science experiment that we're going to do together is all about air pressure. So this is based off of one of the experiments that I did on TikTok that went viral. And so I wanted to do that with you all here today. So we're going to do, this one might get messy. So bear with me here. This experiment is all about air pressure. Air pressure is all around us and it's bearing down on us all the time. Atmospheric pressure is 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's like the weight of a milk jug on the tip of your finger. It's really, really heavy and really, really powerful. But we don't notice it because a lot of people will ask, like, well, if it's so powerful, why aren't our bodies crushed by the power of air? Well, it's because our bodies were made for this. Not only are we not crushed by the power of air, our bodies need air pressure to survive. When we go into space where there is no air, we have to bring our air pressure with us. That's why astronauts wear spacesuits in outer space. We're bringing spacesuits to outer space so that we can bring that pressure with us. One of the most important things that a spacesuit does is provide pressure on your body. And you do that so that the air inside of our bodies, especially in our lungs, stays where it is. Because if we didn't have that air pressure pushing on us, the air inside of us would escape and it would expand our lungs and our lungs would rupture and it wouldn't be good. So we need our air pressure. But one thing that you can do to show how powerful air pressure is, is this upside down water or upside, upside down um, cup experiment. So I have a cup here and there's no tricks here. I don't do any magic tricks. This is all science. Um, so we have a cup of water here and just a piece of cardboard. And so what you'd wanna do is take, let's make sure that this works. Hopefully this works. You put the cardboard on the top and you flip over the glass and then ah, you move your hand. So what's happening here is even though the weight of the water is pushing down, the air inside the glass is pushing down, the atmospheric pressure is pushing on all sides of this glass, including on the bottom of this cardboard. So the air pressure is keeping the cardboard on the glass. That's really cool. But here's another really exciting experiment that we can do that showcases the power of air. This one is really fun. So what you need is a milk jug and a boiled egg peeled. And now look, my goal is to get this boiled egg inside of the glass. How are we gonna do this? Right, we're gonna use the power of air. Well, look at how hard it looks to be able to get that egg inside the bottle. Like if I just pushed it, I would smush the egg. The goal is to try to get in the egg without breaking it, hopefully. Now, the way that you would wanna do that is to be able to have the egg not only pushed in from the outside, but also sucked in from the inside. 
And it's really hard to do unless you know how to uh, change the power of air. So what we're going to do is we're going to heat up the air inside the bottle. And what that's gonna do is make all of those air molecules really, really excited and some are going to escape. We're gonna put the egg on top of the bottle. That's gonna make the fire go out because once you starve a fire of oxygen, it, it can't ignite. And then what's gonna happen is you're gonna have less air in the bottle. That air is gonna get cooler because the fire went out. And what happens when air gets cooler? It condenses. So essentially we're gonna light a fire in here so that we can create a low pressure environment in our bottle so that the air pressure outside will push the bottle into the glass. We're basically gonna create like a vacuum in this so it sucks in the egg. Are you ready? We're gonna light a fire here. This is gonna be, this is gonna be intense. Hopefully I'm not gonna burn down my house with all of you witnessing it. That would be bad. That would not be good. I might have to open a door after this so that my fire alarm doesn't go off. Are you ready? Wish me luck. Here we go. Hold, oh, oh boy. Let me change this a little so it doesn't. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Okay, heart is racing. Heart is racing. Don't burn down your house. Don't burn down your house. Don't burn down your house. Oh, go, 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 go. And just like that, I'm going to open my door so my fire alarm doesn't go off. And just like that, we have an egg inside of our bottle, unscathed, unbroken. It's a beauty. It's a beauty. Now I'm going to take this out so my fire alarm doesn't go off. Now it's the neighbor's problem. But those are some of my most favorite experiments that I like to do. And that one, uh, I think it got like over 2 million views on TikTok. So that's one of my favorite ones to do because it's just like so quick and so violent and it involves fire. So that's super fun. Okay, let's go back to my presentation. And I just got a little bit more than I want to talk about. So start thinking about what questions you have. I want to answer your question. So in like five minutes, we're going to go to your question. So make sure that you have um, you have some questions ready. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk to you all about is why space technology makes life better here on Earth. Because a lot of people ask me, like, why do we invest money in space when we have so many problems down here on Earth? Well, here's why. Everything that we spend money on in space is made to benefit life here on Earth. It's made to make life, um, people's lives better. And one of the things that I am so, so excited about is the fact that space technology is gonna bring internet to the entire planet. Because you may not know this, but only half of the world has access to the internet. The World Wide Web or www.whatever.com, the World Wide Web is not actually worldwide, right? It's really hard to bring internet to people in remote places or to poorer countries. And one of the ways that space technology is hoping to solve that is by launching the biggest satellite constellation, a constellation just means all the satellites are talking to each other, the biggest satellite constellation that the world has ever seen. And they're gonna do that to bring internet to the rest of the planet. And I truly believe that there's not that many things that we could do that would improve the world more than bringing the internet uh, to everyone. Because imagine being able to bring education to students who didn't have access to good schools, or if you're in an area that doesn't have hospitals, you could use Zoom or this service to talk to a doctor, right? You can bring healthcare to everyone and people can use it to build businesses and build their economies. And I just think the whole world would be a little bit better if everybody had internet. Another reason that space technology is helping to make the world a better place is simply by taking pictures of our planet. It wasn't long ago that the only pictures we had of our planet were like, three years old, it would be like taking a birthday picture every three years and trying to understand how you've changed over your whole life. It's just, it's not very effective. But now we have so many satellites taking pictures of our planet that we have a new selfie of our planet every single day, every single day. And that helps us because think of like hurricanes. We can tell when hurricanes are coming. We can um, see when different storms are coming our way. 
you can see how buildings grow up, but also how forests burn down. We can track where a wildfire is burning and find who needs the most help right now. So taking pictures of our planet helps understand how our climate is changing year after year and how our weather is changing day after day. And the last thing I want to talk to you about was why um, one company I'm really excited about is a company called Virgin Galactic. And Virgin Galactic is a company that wants to bring this view to more people. This is the view from space. And Virgin Galactic wants to do that in this space plane. This is a really cool space plane. They want to start um, this idea of space tourism, where for the low, low price of $250,000, <laughs> So it's certainly not cheap, $250,000. You can go to space and become an astronaut. And they're selling tickets right now. They've actually sold over 600 tickets to space. And people like um, Katy Perry and Ashton Kutcher and Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt and Justin Bieber have all bought tickets. And so we will one day live in a world where Justin Bieber is an astronaut. And this is kind of silly, but I do think this is really exciting because when astronauts go to space, they talk about experiencing the overview effect, which is this way to think about yourself and the planet a little differently. Um, when astronauts go to space, they always say that they come back and they want to be better to the environment. They care about climate change more because they see our planet with this paper thin atmosphere and they understand how our humans can change our planet and be a little bit destructive to our environment. So they come back, they wanna be better um, environmentalists. They also see our planet without borders and without the conflict, all the wars and stuff that we have here on earth. And they wanna be better neighbors to each other. They wanna be better friends to each other. Um, and I just think it's really beautiful. They wanna be a better person when they come back. And a company like Virgin Galactic wants to give that experience to more people. And I just think that the types of stories that will be told, the companies that will be made, the art that will be created will be really beautiful when that happens. And I was able to test out um, a virtual reality experience with Virgin Galactic. They showed me what it will look like from space. And here's a TikTok that I did about it. So I'm just telling you that Virgin Galactic sent me an Oculus Quest to be able to experience what their cabin looks like when it's in space. And it was just so incredibly beautiful. So this is what it looks like inside their spaceship. When that spaceship is in space, you can see that it has uh, these 12 windows all around the cabin. So you can see outside into the vastness of space and to see that beautiful blue earth. And this is not actually possible. He won't be able to do this, but if you could do a spacewalk, this is what it would look like on the outside of the spaceship. And keep in mind, this is something that Justin Bieber is going to be doing <laughs> in the next like 10 years. I'm not really sure when he's gonna fly, but I think that's pretty exciting to think. Um, and hopefully one day I'll be able to uh, fly with Virgin Galactic too. I think that sounds super fun. And so, the mostly I, I wanted to leave you all with the message that there are so many wonderful things out there to learn and there are so many different science experiments to do i think science is the language of nature and it feels like magic it just feels like something really fun to be able to understand how the world works so i want you to stay curious realize that there's a lot of fake stuff out there so stay skeptical if you can't recreate the experiment in your own home maybe it's fake <laughs> so stay skeptical and make sure you keep exploring because the world is out there for you to explore thank you all we can take any questions you all have that was so cool thank you so much emily yeah we do have a bunch of questions so i'm going to try to get to these to as many of these as i can and <clears throat> okay, there are a few of them that are kind of the same thing. Have you ever been to space? And if so, when did you go to space and what was it like? Oh, I wish. I So this is actually really crazy to learn. Only 500 and I think 65 people have ever gone to space in the history of time. Only like 565 people. So it's not that many people that have gone to space. 
which is really wild. Um, I personally have never gone to space, but I would love to, and maybe Virgin Galactic will be my way of getting into space later on. Okay, so Brooke has a question. Why is there no gravity in space? Right. Well, it's actually kind of interesting because there's gravity everywhere in the universe, but sometimes you just don't feel it pointing down on your head like we do here on Earth. So, for example, when you are in a rocket ship orbiting the planet, you're just in a constant state of free fall. It's kind of like if you were in an elevator and they cut the cord and the elevator was falling and you're falling inside the elevator you sort of just feel like you're floating. You don't really feel like you're falling. You feel like you're floating. And so the way that people describe orbiting the planet that I think is really helpful is if you were to throw a ball, it goes down like this. It follows a little arch because gravity pushes it down. If I threw it farther, it would go into more of a straight line and eventually fall down. If I threw it even farther, it would go even farther and then fall straight down. If I could throw it fast enough, I could go all the way around the planet and eventually it would come back and maybe hit my head and then fall down. And then if I threw it even faster, it would just keep orbiting the planet in a constant state of free fall. And so the ball feels like it's floating, but in, but in reality, it's just in a constant state of free fall. So there's gravity everywhere, but like sometimes you just don't feel it because you're floating. I In the Vomit Comet, that's what we're doing is or fall inside the plane. So when people say there's no gravity um, on the space station, you can be like, well, actually, there's lots of gravity. You're just in a constant state of free fall. Lisa wants to know, can you float a weather balloon to the edge of Earth? Yes, you can. That's a great question. So you can float a weather balloon to a little over 100,000 feet. It can't go to space. I think space is like 230 some thousand feet. So it can't go to space, but you can send it to what people sometimes call the edge of space. And what's fun is that I was actually able, when I was pregnant with my daughter um, last year, I sent a picture of her ultrasound when she was in my belly on a weather balloon to like 80,000 feet. And I got a picture of the ultrasound with the, like a, basically it looked like space in the background with the curvature of the earth and the blackness of space in the background. So like normal, regular people can send weather balloons up um, to the edge of space, but yeah, they will go up to the edge of space and it's a really fun little engineering uh, project. So I'm gonna ask you a can we control weather? Can we control weather? There are scientists who have theorized that you can. Um, I wanna call it geoengineering. I think that's what it's called. So if you Google geoengineering, you'll find all sorts of ideas on uh, different hypotheses that people have on how to control the weather, uh, mostly like by seeding um, clouds, you can change the chemical composition of a cloud in order to make it rain or thunderstorm. And I, people are very cautious about this idea because for something as complicated as the weather, if you change one thing, you might not know how much you're going to change the weather. You could just change one cloud and all of a sudden you have a huge hurricane and you didn't mean to do that. That's not what you wanted to do but you can't predict all the other things that will happen if you just do this one thing. And so people are generally against it. They think it's a bad idea. They think it's possible. They just think it's morally and ethically like not a very good idea. Uh, Rebhav would like to know, what's the name of your TV show? Yes, so I actually have two. I didn't mention this in the beginning. Um, I have a secret that I'll share with you guys, but you can't tweet about it. It's a, it'll have to be a secret between us. So my show on Fox is called Exploration Outer Space uh, with an X, Exploration Outer Space. It's also on Amazon Prime, but I have a new show coming out on Netflix on August 25th called Emily's Wonder Lab, where I do all of these different like science experiment things with you on, um, on Netflix. And so that one comes out on August 25th and I'm really excited about that one. Oh, that's super fun. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so Maura has a very uh, <laughs> very recent question. What what are you gonna do if TikTok is banned? Oh, such a good question. I was no, I was very scared this weekend when that was announced. Um, I have later learned that that is not 
like not as likely as we thought. Um, I think um, you know the announcement was made very quickly, and there wasn't a lot of thought put into it. And there's actually not a huge possibility that that's going to happen now. But if it does get banned, I would be very, very sad. And I would probably just try to create more on YouTube. But for now, I'm focusing all my energy on TikTok. Cool. Um, and Mary would like to know, did you ever go scuba, dive, scuba diving again after that show? You know, I didn't. But the day after that, I was like, I would go scuba diving today. Mostly because I think I was like so confident and I was so proud of myself for having done it once. And I thought like the only way to keep this energy going is if I did it again. Um, but I didn't have the opportunity to do it again. And so I I would be interested in doing it. But this next time, if I do it again, I wanted to do it in like crystal blue, crystal clear blue waters so that I can see fish and beautiful things. Because all of this nonsense of scuba diving and murky waters, I don't, there's, doesn't live up to the hype. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, okay, Olivia has an awesome question. Can you suck a raw egg into a bottle? Oh, no, I've tried. So I did that on my TikTok. I was I was sure that it wasn't going to go well. I, I was wearing my safety goggles and everything. I thought the egg was going to explode. And so this is what makes for a beautiful science experiment because you're not really sure what's going to happen. And so I put it on the bottle and... I put the fire in and the fire went out. So it prevented the fire from getting enough oxygen so that the fire went out. But here's what happened. A, um, a boiled egg is kind of squishy. And when you put it in the closing, you're creating a fully sealed um, opening. And so that no air can come in and no air can go out. So that when the air condensed, it had to suck the egg in to be able to get the air that it needed. But a raw egg is harder, and I didn't. You weren't able to complete complete a, a full seal, meaning there is spaces around the egg, and so there was space for the air to come in without having to push the egg in. So nothing happened. It was actually I was like, oh, huh, nothing happened. But yeah, I did that on TikTok, so you can see that one, uh, how that worked there. Very cool. Good question. Okay. Yeah. Bill wants to know, so you travel all over the globe for your work. Do you have any particular place or adventure that stands out in your mind? Yeah, I really, so I went to India for the Bill Nye show and that was just, I'd never been to India before. And I got to talk to them about how that country eradicated polio with vaccines and how hard it was to do because there are people, there's so many people in India and a lot of them live in very remote areas. And so to be able to vaccinate all of these different people that live in so many different places, it was like a very wonderful story uh, to learn about. And I went to Russia for my exploration outer space show and going to the Yuri Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center. Yuri Gagarin is the name of the first human that ever went to space. He was Russian. And so they named their, basically it's like their NASA Johnson Space Center. It's their version of that. And so I got to go there where cosmonauts and astronauts go to train before they go into space. And I rode in a human centrifuge, which is something that like spins like this. And the human is like the egg and they sit in here and they do this, it's like a big carnival ride so that you can feel gravitational forces on your hands, the same G forces that you feel when you're launching into space. So I got up to, I think, four G forces, which is about the max that an astronaut is likely to feel on a rocket ship going into space. And that was so cool. I was like, I feel like I'm actually an astronaut. This is so neat. Oh, cool. Uh, okay, so we just have time for a few more, but I was wondering, uh, can you talk a bit about what it was like watching the SpaceX astronauts land yesterday? Oh my goodness, that was such a cool experience because so the big deal with the SpaceX launch um, is that that was the first crewed launch, a first human launch on a private spaceship to the International Space Station. And so when I watched them launch, that was a huge deal because it was a successful launch. They got to the International Space Station but you couldn't really be excited until they were also able to bring them home safely, right? Because it's one thing to get somebody to the International Space Station, but you also need to be able to bring them home safely too. And so yesterday was the day that SpaceX brought them home 
and watching it splash down in the ocean and seeing the astronauts walk out of the vehicle and knowing that they were okay, it was a very, very cool moment to experience. Okay, and Mary has a question, getting back to your books. Uh, she says, I'm wondering if the plot and setting for the first Ada Lace book were inspired by Rear Window, uh, and where do you get your ideas for the rest of the series? Yeah, they absolutely were. And that was a, uh, so all of my books are co-written with my co-author, Tamsin Weston. So you can see her name on the book as well. And so we kind of go back and forth on plot ideas. And it's a really fun way to uh, work because it's like a team. We're working as a team to create these stories. And sometimes for me, the way that I like to write stories is I learn about a cool science or a new technology or gadget. And I'm like, how do I find a way to get this into a story. And so I start with the technology that I'm really excited about. And then I think like, oh, what ways could she get in trouble with this technology? What ways could this technology go wrong? Or what fun could she have with this technology? And so I start with the technology and I try to think of a plot idea from there. And then Tamsin and I often go back and forth on um, ideas that she has and ideas that I have. And it's just like writing a book with a friend. And speaking of books, Olivia would like to know, what is your favorite book? Ooh, what is my favorite book? I mean, my favorite series is probably the Harry Potter books. I'm just, I I love Harry Potter so, 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 so much. Um, I, I think they are, they, they just like transport you to this world that, that you wish was real and makes you feel like magic is alive. And I that's one of my favorite series of all time. Cool. Okay, so two more. First, Sarah would like to know what's your TikTok name? My on TikTok, TikTok, I'm at the Space Gal. So everything, if you just search the Space Gal, G A L, the Space Gal, you'll find me on there. Okay, and last question. This one's one of my questions. So mm -hmm. I find space kind of terrifying. So can you tell me, in your opinion, one thing about space that's super scary and one thing about space that is super cool? Well, one thing about space is that we know that it's not going to last forever. Like we know the universe is going to end someday. Um, there's scientific evidence to show that the universe will someday end. I started reading this book from one of my friends called The End of Everything, astronomically speaking. And there are, I think, five different theories that astrophysicists astrophysicists have on how the universe will end. And it's just like exciting to think that like the universe is gonna end someday and what's gonna happen after that. Is there an after that? Like all of these questions are so exciting. Um, and I think the other really cool thing about space is that we still have so much to learn. Um, one thing that I find really interesting is that it wasn't until the last like 10 or 15 years that we had evidence that planets existed outside of our solar system. You may have heard of these referred to as exoplanets or extrasolar planets, meaning they are outside of our solar system, exoplanets. And I just, I find that so fascinating. Now we know there are billions and billions of planets. There's at least one planet for every star that you see in the night sky out in the universe. And there's, I mean, I, I just find that fascinating because it shows you that the universe is so big, but it also shows you that there's still so much that we don't know. So we need scientists and engineers to ask the right questions, to ask these big questions, like are we alone in the universe and work to find those answers. So I just think it's really beautiful that there's still so much to learn. Oh, that's such a great spot uh, to end it on. And ooh, I brought myself back up. Emily, I just want to say thank you so much. That was so much fun. That was so cool. Uh, and for everybody here, uh, thank you guys for joining us. And uh, one of the coolest things about this is if you come to this link just in a little bit, you can rewatch this and watch all of Emily's experiments again. And with your parents' permission, maybe try a couple of them at home. Uh, so Emily, on behalf of the library and, and everyone joining us, thank you so much. Camp Explorers, keep exploring. And we will see everybody next week. Stay safe.